So our next guest is a chap called Tony Gosling. Tony has worked uh, for the BBC. We're going to bring Tony in and Tony's going to give us some information about what he's done and then we're going to get stuck into talking about everything and anything. Good evening, Tony. How are you doing? I'm doing fine, thanks. Thanks very much for uh, having me on. No problem, Tony. Listen, Tony, thanks for coming on the show. And we know you have a, a very varied background, but definitely working for the BBC was a, the, the big interest uh, to us to have you on talking about that. So before we get stuck into talking about the BBC and what's been going on there, um, do you want to give us a bit of a background, just to let listeners know what you have done in your in your career? Okay, well, I started off in the aviation business, basically. Um in the family business, working in that for a while, but kind of got, uh, you know, once you've flown one plane and gone from one airport to another airport, you start to get a bit bored with it all. And uh, I realised that I needed to do a job which was going to be a challenge every day. And actually, that's what journalism turned out to be for me, an incredible education, really a non-stop education ever since I first started. So I started off in uh, community radio uh, in South East London, in Woolwich, Greenwich area, uh, and then... Uh, that radio station was being run by what was at the time the Greater London Council. So it was being supported by Ken Livingstone uh, from the 1980s. The money ran out and they so decided, oh, we're going to privatise this, basically sell it off to a kind of commercial radio company. Now, when they moved in, first thing they did was got rid of all of the best presenters on there. You know, it was, it, there was a guy called Gary R.B. He was absolutely, he was the greatest Elvis expert I ever came across. And yes, he did used to make mistakes using the turntables. And sometimes the records would, you'd hear the scrap, uh, the needle go across the record before it started and that sort of thing. But he was brilliant. And, uh, and it, and I realized what was going on here. They were turning this into some sort of disgusting kind of slick commercial operation. And it wasn't going to be community radio anymore. Uh, so then I phoned up the BBC in London. I said, look, I've got all this experience. I've been making programs here for a year or so now, and uh, I want to do some real radio. And the guy said, go away, you know, basically. So I just kept hassling them. Eventually they said, oh, come round for breakfast, and which is when I got the first job at the BBC. And um, started there in the in Maranabin High Street. In uh, the, the top floor of that building is was the Radio Times offices. And uh, worked there for over a year on literally on the news every day. So when I turn up at work, it was about 10, worked about 10 till 6 p.m., 7 p.m. shifts. Uh, you know, you'd be getting stuck into the news of the day. And literally for the lunchtime Johnny Walker program and for the drive time, uh, the Tommy Vance show for the whole of London. And we had a massive listenership. Just to give you an idea, I mean, there was some guy I remember one just coming up to Christmas. It must have been about 1990. Uh, somebody phoned in to the radio station saying, look, I've just had my car stolen with a whole load of Christmas presents in it. And, uh, and, and, it, and I said to the producer at the time, I said, look, this guy wants to go on the radio and put an appeal to anyone's seen his car. Uh, and the producer said, I'll just put him on, you know, come on, it's Christmas. And we put him on. And you know what? Within a minute, the guy had phoned in, he'd stolen his car and uh, told him exactly where it was parked. So he got back, got his Christmas presents back uh, just in time for um, Christmas. It was that sort of station, and it, uh, which is an amazing thing in London. I mean, it's not really the same kind of sound now. It's called BBC for London now, and it's very heavily overproduced. It's kind of m much more corporate now. But in those days, it really was public service, and we, we felt it, we were kind of doing a, a great service for London. It's also the place where the very first black broadcasters were working, uh, doing things like doing programmes during the Brixton riots and this kind of thing. And it was an exciting place to be. So that's where I cut my teeth in journalism, doing lots of national stories, even though it was supposedly just a local station. Uh, and then I went on to work in Southampton, Salisbury, Swindon and, and lots of, of the local stations. After that, got into environmental activism, I left uh, BBC really over a couple of, I mean, you know, at the time I was complaining a little bit because we discovered a couple of us freelancers in Salisbury that, um, which by the way is where Ted Heath was living, uh, that uh, there was uh, two children's homes where there was sexual abuse of kids going on. Um, and we reported this up the chain of command, so to speak, saying, look, you know, we think we should do an investigation into this. And there was a chatting to people at the Salisbury Journal too. And uh, all of a sudden, I got the sack. So you know, that's mm. I, I, it didn't take me much to put two and two together here. And yeah. police, the police apparently had looked into these accusations, which looked to us pretty solid. 
And they said, oh, there's nothing to see here. This is the Wiltshire Constabulary, and that'll look, apparently. And, and it was connected to the guy who is the deputy leader of the Conservative group on Salisbury District, the ruling group on Salisbury District Council, actually ran these two children's homes. So, you know, this is, to me, was a kind of, in a way, the prelude to what's happened with Jimmy Savile. And funnily enough, you know, it's weird how these things work, but uh, I work very closely at Southampton, Radio Solent and the TV down there, uh, with a woman called Liz McKean. Now, people may know, Liz. it was Liz at Newsnight that put together the Jimmy Savile reports and interviewed some of his, uh, two of his victims, or survivors, if you want to call them that. Um, and so Liz did this amazing piece of work at the top, Really doing the, 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 you know, really should have come out, which is when uh, the uh, editor then said, "Oh, we're not going to run this because there's a Jimmy Savile special coming up at Christmas." So you can see I've been through this kind of uh, uh, difficult time through the BBC. Got into environmental activism, squatting, doing land occupations, that sort of thing with this group, the Land Is Ours and George Monbiot back in the 90s. Uh, but now, and really for the last eight years or so, I've been doing a current affairs program in Bristol. Uh, which was very much really like the sort of stuff we were doing in London. Uh, it's just I'm producing and presenting it, and we do every week uh, another little look at uh, international and national news, because that's what we don't get. They do it in Germany, but we don't do it in Britain. That is to say, uh, regional, uh, national, if, you, if that makes sense to you. you know, so this is national and international news coming from the regions, and that's what we do on this radio show in Bristol. Uh, which is the Friday Politics Show on every week uh, online at thisweek.org.uk. Fantastic. Well, I was just going to say with the, the background in the radio, that's up Steve's alley because Steve, I think, um, well, you know, you're the, you're the radio man when it comes to the radio stations in the 80s and we've talked about this before and what Tony said just sounds to what you said about the pirate radio stations in the 80s and how they, they probably weren't as professional as the, or, you know, RTEs and stuff. Yeah. But if you want to just, you know, Talk to Tony about that. So yeah, well, they were the experience. Yeah, I suppose they weren't professional, but they done it. They done it for the love of it, obviously, and and that's what what kind of uh, gave him gave him the audience. And actually, when you mentioned you mentioned the name there, uh, Tony uh, Johnny Walker, uh, that brought me right back uh, to I think Johnny Walker on, on Caroline. I think he's dead now. Uh, rest, may he rest in peace. But um, yeah, I, I know like yeah, people done it for the love of it, and then obviously Big Brother seeing that you know it it could be manipulated. And uh, obviously commercialised, and that's I think uh, that, in my opinion, is when it all went downhill. Yeah. Pers- yes, uh, certainly at the BBC. I mean, they, basically, the way it all happened was 1987. Uh, we had a Conservative government. We had a very, very uh, tough. I mean, it was basically year after year. It was somebody's uh, turn, whether it's the miners, the travellers, to get a, the Tory boot in the teeth. Uh, in 1987, it was the BBC's turn, and they've been doing some very good programmes, really. Uh, one, pr- for example, called Maggie's Militant Tendency, which is all about the far right in the Tory party, looking at people like Jonathan Aitken, and um, re- you know, making you realise that these mainstream Tory MPs, ministers even, were very, very close. In fact, some of them were going along to these uh, fascist meetings. So it was a very powerful panorama. And I actually can't imagine something like that happening today because the, what happened was uh, Victor Rothschild had a word in the ear of Margaret Thatcher and uh, spoke to the chairman of the BBC at the time, it was Marmaduke Hussey, and said, can you sack the director general? And Hussey said, I'm not really sure, and eventually realised that he, you know, by, by various means he could sack the director general. And uh, so Alastair Milne, who's the father of the present uh, press advisor to Jeremy Corbyn was promptly booted out of the BBC for backing all these independent programs. Now, he hadn't been biased. He'd been doing anti-Labour militant. You know, they've been doing both sides, which is what the BBC should do. And look, this is a key thing that people seem to have forgotten, is that as journalists, people like me need to have a basic kind of tenured right to keep their jobs. Now, this is quite normal at a university. If you you know that the government can't boot you out because you, you're, you've got a security of tenure there, basically. And uh, so our universities and our um, media, it has, since the end of this, has really gone really terribly downhill uh, because everybody that's in their jobs has become self-censoring, really, because they're 
they're scared of upsetting the government and particularly at the BBC, you know, obviously being government funded, Royal Charter, all that sort of thing. Do you, do, do, I, Tony, do you think that does uh, laziness as well and plagiarism came in? Just they're, they're just seeing stories on the Internet and just plagiarising and then putting it out there rather than actually doing the research as well. Well, look, I think it's really that the all of the best journalists just get booted out. That's what happens. And you end up with people who are very mediocre or, or right wing, like people like Andrew Marr, you know, who were basically w right behind Tony Blair and the war in Iraq. People like that are promoted. So you get a kind of self-censorship. You get an atmosphere created whereby everybody knows what they're supposed to think, what they're supposed to say. I mean, George Orwell called it groupthink, didn't he? You know, everybody's supposed to know. And it's the same exact thing going on in the world of finance uh, at universities and in finance journalism, is there's this kind of orthodoxy accepted that, oh, well, you know, this quantitative easing is the only real way out, blah, blah. And actually, of course, there's lots of other things which are simply not looked at, not just out of laziness, but because people are constantly aware that they may lose their jobs, they may uh, stop getting decent, good assignments, they may not be being fed the right, you know, good stories anymore. Mm -hmm. And, you know, at the end of the day, they, most journalists, of course, have got mortgages, they've got kids to look after, they've got wives to look after, and that's the way they get you. You know, luckily for me, uh, you know, I just didn't have uh, family at the time. And um, so I just decided, look, I'm going to, uh, you know, uh, my, my my word on the radio or the TV or whatever is worth exactly what, because I, you know, I'm going to say exactly what I think. And that seems to me to be what's now lacking is there's a lack mm. of courage. Yeah. I mean, one person that did that, I mean, if you go back, you can see bit by bit various aspects of the BBC have been cut out over the last 20 years or so. One of the last really good programs was a documentary made by Jonathan Meads. Uh, called Jerry Building, which is all about Nazi architecture. And he really lays into things like, for example, he has a go at Prince Charles in that. He says, well, look, this Leon Creer is Prince Charles's favourite architect. And he's the big, he calls him the Speer carrier for Albert Speer, who was the uh, armaments minister under Hitler and also the chief architect of most of the Nazi uh, uh, architecture, including things like the Nuremberg rally site, you know. So, you know, he's not afraid to put the boot into Prince Charles and neither should any other journalist be. Yeah, I think it's all, as you say, um, we have the same over here, Tony, where um, the, the media, well, the problem is, is that we have a, a chap over here, a billionaire called Dennis O'Brien, and he's snapped up the majority of the media over here in Ireland, which means obviously he controls the whole lot. Um, and of course, you're going to get your propaganda as usual. Um, so the BBC, uh, I lived in London for 17 years. So I'm familiar with um, some of the radio programs and obviously uh, TV programs um, uh, during the 90s as well. And um, yeah, it's just the control of the media. I mean, what we what we we're seeing over here, it's it's uh, it's just it's just majorly controlled. Now I know you wanted to talk about, and I think it's important that we we do talk about the BBC and when that was kind of sinisterly taken over in the early 90s. Well, yeah, it was. Uh, also, I ought to say, Johnny Walker's still very much alive and kicking. Uh, you know, he, I think, in fact, he's still on BBC Radio 2 on a Saturday afternoon or a Sunday afternoon or something. Uh, worth mentioning that. I wasn't sure. I just checked it up. And, uh, yeah, he is. But, look, with the uh, self-censorship, what it's doing is it's slowly but surely cutting off all of the possibilities that we have of making sense of the world around us. It's It's herding us around. Uh, and that's, that's what we, we try and do with the programme in Bristol every week, is to make sure that listeners have got uh, a much wider spread of opinion. The idea is, uh, with, the, with the BBC, is to narrow down the spectrum of different types of views that people are exposed to. Mm. And so, for example, when I say things like, well, actually, the Treasury could start printing money tomorrow if it wanted to, nobody else is saying that, you know, nobody at all. Yeah. Um, when you're talking about things like uh, actually the British Army aren't really interested in going abroad, they are quite happy to train uh, to defend Britain, uh, but they don't want to go abroad. I mean, there's a lot of soldiers that think exactly like that. And, you know, you don't hear that kind of view mm. expressed. So th that's what we try and do is break these these various taboos. The other thing is, I mean, we, we, we always look in. <laughs> one of the things I always look into is power. So where are the decisions really being made? Because so much of what we see, you know, over there in Ireland and in Britain and almost all over the Western world and in Russia, too, of course, and China, is the decisions are being made far away from Parliament and far away from the people that we elect. 
uh, the decisions are really made by these kind of interest, big interest groups, lobby groups of the banksters and big business. Mm. That's where the real decisions are being made. So the idea is, I suppose, to try and pull away the, the veil a little bit like, you know, the Wizard of Oz. You know, like who's actually behind there and who's making these decisions? Because power rests largely with people that you would never even recognize if you passed them in the street. Yeah, well, that's the kind of, if you want to call it the secret society and the uh, the secret handshake club, um, where the people at the top, and when we all know that they're all controlled puppets anyway, and they're pulled by the strings, I mean, they, that's why we talked about the Trump and Hillary selection as opposed to well, the uh, election. Well, okay, let me just stop you there, because I don't think they totally controlled a lot of these people. Mm. I mean, for example, Robin Cook, was he was a very independent-minded guy. I mean, he was the uh, foreign secretary under Blair, and he resigned. Uh, and then he had an accident, didn't he? He fell off a mountain or something. He had a heart attack. Apparently, his... yeah, apparently. Yeah, so mm. I think that there are people who are in these mm. positions of power who do have their own minds and uh, and have got very much sort of, you know, thoughts of their own. For example, Jeremy Corbyn, I think, is one of those. I don't think he's a puppet. But those are the people you will find, you know, miraculously or, or whatever the opposite of a miracle is, you know, suddenly find themselves either sick or ill. I actually was watching Jeremy Corbyn on the telly a couple of nights ago and he looked absolutely sick as a dog. You know, I don't know what's happened to him. I, I don't think it's just a lack of sleep, but he really does look ill. Well, he, but it, he's a member of the Fabian Society, as is Tony Blair and a few other people. So I think, you know, investigation and you have to kind of look into what's, you know, what these societies are all involved in and why well, are people totally, like... Well, look, I totally agree with you that, that a lot of these societies like the Fabians, mm. the Bilderbergers, mm. etc., are very influential. Yeah. But sometimes, I mean, I've seen, for example, you know, people go along to these Bilderberg conferences who actually then start kicking back against it all. You know, they're not necessarily part of, uh, you know, a kind of organised plan. And in fact, sometimes they get into these... Uh, uh, circles, these power circles, and then they start saying, well, hang on a minute, this, this is not the way I... I mean, one really good example is the former editor of the Observer magazine, or the newspaper, Will Hutton. He went along to these Bilderberg meetings. Uh, this is back in the late 1990s. And then he started kicking off against them in his newspaper, you know, and he's calling them the high priests of globalization, which is, a, you know, really taking the mickey out of them. So, you know, this this whole uh, attitude, anyone that's anything to do with any of these societies is part of the conspiracy, I think is actually wrong. Some people are part of it and then they, they just get annoyed with it. They get, OK, usually as soon as they start kicking off against it or make any kind of public comment against it, their their public profile will start to plummet. But some of them are brave enough to actually speak out. So do you think, obviously the, the, the Robin Cook issue is an ideal example where he did speak out, and you, you are right, some of them do stand up and, and say, I'm not happy about this, and he resigned, and then, you know, all of a sudden he had an accident on a ski slope, or whatever, on a mountain, or whatever well, the accident you know, was. What actually happened with Robin Cook, which mm. is horrific really, mm. is that he had a heart attack apparently of some kind mm. uh, up on a Ben stack in Scotland. Mm. And just so happened to be a helicopter on an exercise passing nearby. So when uh, the, I think it was his wife, Gaynor, that phoned the ambulance or phoned 999 or whatever on the mobile phone, this helicopter just happened to be in the vicinity and came uh, to take him off to hospital. Uh, but the most shocking thing about it all was the helicopter crew refused to let Gaynor get into the helicopter. So, yes, they that she helped get his body. Well, it wasn't. He was quite very much alive at the time into the helicopter, at which point the, uh, there was some kind of um, uh, you know, altercation. And they said, no, 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 you can't come too. You can't get in. She's saying, well, what are you talking about? It's my husband. You can't take him. At which point they, you know, put on the accelerator and off they went. And by the time he got to the hospital, he was dead. So, you know, this is the sort of the other th another thing which may interest you to do with the, the uh, death of Robin Cook is that he was a very, very popular man in Scotland. And uh, particularly in that area, people knew that he loved that part of Scotland. And they, they set up a memorial at the roughly the spot where the helicopter landed, etc., to Robin. Now, you know what happened? About a, about a year after the, the memorial, was a, a, a giant cairn was put there in memory to, to Robin Cook. The cairn was demolished by the local council, if you can believe that. Well, I can, because that's what, that's what happens. You know, um, it just it's amazing when you see people in politics, especially in the UK as well as Ireland. I mean, what's happening over here in Ireland is probably the same in the UK. We have masses of, of, of homelessness um, and evictions yeah, yeah. going on, foreclosures, and it's just 
un- it's just reaching a scale that is unbelievable and the politicians are there and they're saying they're talking about the GDP going up and there's great growth and things are going brilliant and there's more jobs being created and it's such a bag of BS it's <laughs> unbelievable and so they believe their own PR basically this is or maybe the yes men around them are all telling them that you know everybody's saying you're brilliant you're, you you know you should stay in government you know this is what we said earlier on the show I know you probably wouldn't have heard heard the Tony uh, at the start of the show but on their a, lo- a local radio station over here in Ireland called News Talk um, they uh, talked about the latest opinion polls show Fine Gael, which is one of the government parties over here in Ireland, a uh, regaining position as most popular party in Ireland. They are hated with a vengeance. So, I mean, the majority of the people, you know, they know what politics is about. And any time they see um, the politicians, I mean, you know, the names used are quite colourful. Parasite being one of them, which is... Um, which is quite convenient because that's that tends to be what the, what they what they are, and we know the game. I, I don't know much about the UK politics, but over here in Ireland, we have what's called the party whip system, and the senior politicians control everything. It's a, a democratic dictatorship. We do, and democracy is is mob rule. When, when I hear people saying, "Oh, we have democracy." That that means to me, you know, that's saying to me, you don't understand what democracy is because it's mob rule. And well, the, uh, part of the part of the uh, operation to control the population. I mean, this is really what this is about. I mean, it is about mass control of mass populations. If you go uh, back, you can have a look at a very good series that was on in, uh, I think it was about 2002 or something, uh, by Adam Curtis called The Century of the Self which is all about public relations. And that seems to have totally invaded the uh, whole political sphere. So, you know, you, you, you're talking about mass mind control, really, and that being done through the press. And as we were saying earlier on, controlling the debate, controlling the narrative, controlling the national narrative. And that's where I think we've just let our populations down, is by allowing the mass media to just be co- co-opted by a ruling elite, you know, whatever you want to call these people, I would call them a criminal elite because it's quite clear the massive crimes that went on, uh, particularly in 2008 over the bank bailouts. Mm. What you've seen there is, first of all, uh, for several years, these big banks, mostly uh, banks like uh, Lloyd's, uh, RBS um, and NatWest, etc., uh, and Northern Rock as well, having false accounting for mm. several years with whole massive amounts of so-called assets on their books, which were worth nothing at all. Now, not only of those firms that signed off those accounts, the auditors got off scot-free, but they've also got together in a little criminal gang in order to make sure that this can continue to happen in the future. So we're talking about PricewaterhouseCoopers, KPMG, Deloitte's, uh, the main what, main culprits of this. And so they are basically in collusion, the auditors, with all the big banksters to fleece the public. Now, uh, my colleague Martin Summers, I do the radio show with every Friday, he calls them the suicide bombers, right? Because the banks sit in the room with the politicians and they say, unless you do this, we're going to close all the cash points at midnight. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So effectively, they are... They are. They're financial terrorists. Max Kaiser talks about this term as well. Yeah. And these people are criminals. They have stolen uh, literally uh, tens or hundreds of billions of pounds from the public. Those banks should have gone bust by law, you know, and they didn't. And so what they've done is they've used all that public money that they stole in 2008 with the collusion of Gordon Brown and others, by the way. Um, They've used that to lobby for more and more power. So we've got really the only thing stopping uh, the public understanding what's really going on is by controlling the press. And I think that is the key to all of this, is if you can, these people have realised, look, if, if us criminals can control the press and we can control the media, the broadcasting outlets, which, by the way, have been less and less and less, you know, over the years. Yeah. There used to be a do- very diverse ownership of the press. Now it's only in a handful of hands. Yeah. If we can control that, we can control the outcome of this. So that's what the criminal elite's big prize is to be able to control the press like they do in places like South America, you know, just to make sure they can cover their own crimes. And the press has become, I mean, it's also, of course, involved in war. 
big style, like with Syria, Libya, etc., demonizing the next, you know, so-called dictator or the next person whose oil we want to steal. They'll demonize them for weeks and weeks and weeks. And then that's cover for the army to go in. So we're now seeing, I think, you know, that the, the, the criminal elite using the media pretty much, they can pretty much guarantee that they can spin out their lies every time. And now we've seen just in the last week or so, this whole thing about fake news. I don't know if you've seen it. It's a fantastic article on The Intercept. Uh, about this, and uh, the we, we we did mention it at the start of the show. I know it's hilarious, isn't it? The people that sold us the r- rubbish about weapons of mass destruction are now preaching about fake news out there on the <laughs> internet. <laughs> I know. I just we mentioned it at the start of the show, and basically what's happening, and I'm sure you've seen it, Tony D, on YouTube t- today. I've seen the same article on three different channels, and it's like all the clickbait. So not only are we getting the fake news. So what I, what I said earlier was. Uh, on 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 the show at the start of the show was that what I think they're going to do, and this is just my opinion, is they're going to fill the internet with more 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 and more fake news, and then blame it on the alternative media and say that the alternative media need to be shut down because of all this fake news when they're the ones that are actually doing the fake news in the first place. Well, of course they are. You know, it's crazy, isn't it? And I mean, what they're trying to do, I think, I mean, I, I, I was on the show on Friday, we were discussing this, a really good discussion about it. And uh, w- what I would suggest is going on here is you've got, I mean, I see the ruling elite, the criminal elite as a kind of Sauron's tower, you know, from the Lord of the Rings, this kind of eye looking, looking down, kind of, you know, a kind of searchlight kind of sweeping around for the next person to destroy or whatever, anybody that dares to speak against them. And what we've seen with Russians do very effectively, both in Ukraine uh, and Crimea and down in Syria, is actually block the military ambitions of these people. Uh, and they've done that pretty pretty effectively. We're just about to see, it looks like, the uh, uh, liberation of Aleppo finally back to the proper government of Syria after all these terrorists we funded uh, have been running the roost, ruling the roost there for a while. And uh, so the eye of Sauron then turns in, in, into domestic politics and onto the domestic scene. And that's what they can't bear, is that there are people like you and I that are out there informing the public and that they can't control us. Uh, also, of course, they're very annoyed with other groups like, uh, like uh, Russia Today. They seem to have a particular problem with Russia Today. Big time, they, yeah. They keep, they keep calling it some sort of Putin's mouthpiece. Well... Tell me if Theresa May's mouthpiece isn't the BBC, because I see almost all the main political presenters being very, very much pro-Tory party on the BBC night after night. So, you know, that, I think, is the only way to see, the, or the, well, I mean, I'm sure there are other ways, but is that they're getting scared. They're getting rattled by the fact that social media has allowed the public, the population, to be put straight in touch with people like you and I at the blink of an eye. There are people like Patrick Henningsen, for example, as well, doing 21st Century Wire in the States, doing an absolutely brilliant professional job on making sure that almost any major international incident has got, you've got a real expert, you know, there at a click of a button. And, uh, you know, this is what's rallying them, is they've lost control of it. This is what we said. Funny enough, it's, we said this earlier on the show as well, about the mainstream media. Um, and we said, uh, one of the things we said earlier on the show is, people need to be start looking at getting internet radios. If they get internet radios, one of the radios that we looked at is a Hammer IR-110. And that is, um, we're not, uh, we don't promote Wi-Fi, by the way, and we have reasons why we don't promote Wi-Fi. But it's, you can hardwire this internet radio, and you can program in your own radio stream. So get rid, get rid of your normal radios, knock off your TVs, and get internet radios, and then tune in to the stations that you want to listen to, the alternative radio stations that you want to listen to, and get the real news. And this is what we were we said earlier in the show. So great minds think alike. Steve has a question for you there, Steve. Yeah, just uh, I'm wondering, Tony, <clears throat> with all the the information that's floating around um, in, in relation to Brexit and what's happening there, I'm just wondering what what are your thoughts on that and do you believe come next March that Theresa May will actually trigger Article 50? Because I know there are, there are people trying to block that left, right and centre. And uh, as recently as Friday, I think people were, were saying that, um, I, I don't know if it has to, it has to go somewhere. They, they want, I think it's the House of Lords to get involved uh, to basically say whether, you know, they, they can actually go ahead and do this or if it needs, they, they need to... Um, 
they need to kind of look further into it. And they're also saying as well, again, I heard this on Friday, that um, they're going to start putting lots of information out there now to let people know, the public know, that this is exactly what's going to happen if we trigger Article 50 and try and scaremonger people uh, into possibly having a second election. Well, look, uh, summer 2015, the Greeks voted to leave the euro, didn't they? But they're still there. Well, we, um, we voted to leave the, uh, the Lisbon Treaty. We voted no, and they said, ah, oh, no, you got it wrong. We're going to ask you again. Well, of course, look, there's, there is an agenda out there, right? The United States of Europe, it's called. Uh, the US started the ball rolling at the end of the Second World War, funded the European movement, um, and that, uh, the whole thing of European Monetary Union was always a major part of that funded by the CIA, funded by Nazis like Alan Dulles, you know, people like that were behind this. And there's a lot of people also that would point to this um, document, which you can find online, which is from 1942, written in Berlin, called the Europäischen Wirtschaftsgemeinschaft, which was their recipe for uh, basically cartels, German cartels, mainly, to be running Europe. So all of the areas of major industry would be divided up between basically a bunch of gangs uh, territorially, and you know that there would be no competition. They would be able to charge what they wanted. And that's the sort of world we're starting to see now. Uh, so, yeah, I think with Brexit, uh, you know, let's look at what the Europe, European Union was really all about, which we joined in 1973, but it wasn't, certainly we didn't join a political union, and it slowly transmogrified into one, didn't it? Um, so I actually, I'm quite proud of the Brits for voting for Brexit. Very glad to see it. It's almost like we have yet again started the ball rolling against the kind of fascist system, and it looks also as if, say, for example, the French, the Italians, even the Germans were given an opportunity to vote out of the EU. They'd almost certainly do so. Now, back to your main point about what's going to happen next March. Well, I honestly think that's anyone's guess. And there's this, these kinds of things are contested. Yeah? So I think that there is definitely a massive pushback to persuade Theresa May, to persuade the cabinet uh, that actually this isn't a very good idea, blah, blah, blah. We've seen leaks today. I don't know if you've seen this story that Mark Carney is plotting at the Bank of England to make sure that Britain stays in the European Union until 2021. Uh, that's a document that some uh, bright spark leaked to the Independent uh, just today, I think. So, you know, there's all sorts of forces ranged against Theresa May. Uh, no, it's also worth remembering that she was a Remainer, you know, so it's very strange that yeah. the Conservative Party, without any kind of vote of its members, mm. should replace uh, one Remainer with another Remainer uh, as Prime Minister. So there was no real change at the top. And there's also a lot of doubt over to whether Boris Johnson was really a, uh, a, a Brexiteer or a Remainer. And we've had this whole phenomenon of the, of the Ramonas, haven't we? You know, the people that are just griping on and on and on about, oh, no, this, they made the wrong decision, a bit like you guys in Lisbon. So I honestly don't know. One thing I can tell you for sure is that the international financial elite, the criminal elite I was talking about before, are going to kick Britain in the short and curlies when it comes to putting in that uh, Article 50 letter. The idea being to show Britain out as an example to yeah. the whole of the rest of Europe before they get into the major elections of next year is to say, well, look, guys, don't you dare vote out of the EU because you're going to suffer like Britain suffers. So there, I think this is what's going on, is that there is a lot of preparation being made to make sure Britain's economy screams next Easter uh, or whenever it is this, this letter goes in. Um, and that will be there to to you know show an example to the rest of Europe. Look, this is what you do if you cross us and if you start to kick back against this United States of Europe because we intend to carry on with it. Yeah, I've I've heard that information too, Tony. That that was the plan, and um, that the UK would be made an example of Europe uh, to say this is what's going to happen if anybody else attempts to do this. Um, to move out of Europe now. Well, look, but just just quickly, there, there's a, a couple of people who've been saying this, which I thought is it's wor worth mentioning. People who are very close to the criminal elite. One of them is Vince Cable, and I say that because of my work on the Bilderberg conferences. Is that Shell, Royal Dutch Shell? Uh, he was the chief economist at Shell, and he's very very close to the people that really run things. Uh, you know, the Shell, for example, was a, com a company that during the war. Uh, had basically split itself into two, and so they were half on the side of the Nazis and half on the side of the, of the Allies, knowing that whoever won the war, they were going to make a fortune. 
you know, that's the sort of person that is, that, you know, that these are the kinds of people that were on both sides. I mean, even, the, for example, the British royal family were very much divided. There was a lot of pro-fascist people within the royal family. There were even within the uh, the army, you know. For example, there was this M section of MI6 during the Second World War, which was being run by Major Desmond Morton. Ian Fleming was working for them and various other people you know, very close to Winston Churchill, who seemed to be running their own little private army funded by the king. Uh, and so there is all sorts of questions about who is really running things here. And sometimes there are factions that they don't really care which way a war finishes. They're going to make money anyhow. Well, this, uh, it's all about money. I mean, we, we've heard about Prescott Bush funding the Germans. Then we've heard about Hilfiger um, doing the uniforms for the German army and IBM supplying the computers for the German army as well. It's business. I mean, that's what well, it, it is. is. Yeah, but the thing is, it's also, I would say it's actually not just about money. It's about power and control. Yeah, is yeah. That money is a means to power. Money is as a means to control. If you look at uh, the uh, history of the Second World War, this more recent uh, attack on Islam uh, since 9-11 attacks, since around about that time, once there was the fall of the Soviet Union, uh, Islam has now replaced uh, the Soviets and communism as the big bugbear. We've got to have an enemy, obviously, you know, in order to justify all this massive defence spending. Is you've actually really got an attack on monotheistic faith. I mean, to begin with, you had this attack on the Jews, completely insane, uh, uh, by Hitler. Although, of course, there are many Jewish people are in, in powerful positions and abuse those positions just like anyone else does. It was a real attempt to uh, try and make. Every Jew appear to have been a problem in Nazi Germany, and they did. They spent a lot of time demonising ordinary Jews, really, the rabbinic tradition, and they started to smash it to pieces, to stamp it out uh, under the Nazi control in Europe, you know, basically using these, as you said, IBM Hollerith machines. Mm. There's that brilliant book by Edwin Black, which looks very closely at the way that actually IBM... It was actually IBM that designed large parts of the uh, extermination of the Jews program. Basically, the Nazis said to IBM, look, we're not quite sure how to do this. And IBM come forward and say, well, hey, we're the solutions people. Mm. We can help you. We, they designed the means by which uh, Jews were first identified uh, and then... Which uh, was the punch were, card system. That's right. Yeah. And, but, uh, they were first identified who they were. Then they took their assets off them. Then they put them into ghettos. Uh, and then they began the pro program of either expelling them from the country or putting them in concentration camps and exterminating them. So this is an I very much an IBM system that was designed here, working very closely with the Nazis. And look, if you go back to the 1930s, which is where we're talking about here, when they, these deals were done, uh, you're also looking at a very similar situation economically, and that's what's so chilling about this. You know, after the 1929 crash, you then had Teddy Roosevelt and the New Deal in the United States, which was a brilliant plan to start to, um, you know, get government spending going, you know, the New Deal. They started spending loads and loads of money, borrowing loads of money to spend it to get the economy going again. And uh, that was starting to work. So that's why in 1933, there was this attempted coup in the US with Prescott Bush and various other of these Nazi, basically pro-Nazi industrialists in America uh, who tried to get rid of uh, Roosevelt because he was making such a good deal with this new deal. So, you know, I guess that's a, it's a similar kind of tension that's going on at the top right now. It's funny that you just mentioned earlier Alan Dulles. Um, I'm in the middle of reading Ben Rich's book, uh, Got to Do with the Skunk Works, and Alan, Alan Dulles is there in the 1950s uh, involved in the Skunk Works and, and the Secret Projects, the YouTube project, uh, the YouTube product uh, and the uh, Blackboard and uh, the SR71. And it just so happens you mentioned there. Do you have uh, questions for Tony there, Steve? Yeah, we have a question from Joan. Joan is just wondering, Tony, what do you think of the, or what do you say about the army of the EU? Well, it's happening, isn't it? I mean, this yeah. is one of the things they held back to make sure that the people in Britain wouldn't be thinking or talking about this in the run-up to the Brexit vote. I mean, I think it's pretty clear. Uh, what we've got is we've got a consolidation of power into Brussels. OK, you remember that's NATO headquarters there too, so military power is bound to be part of it all. I, I actually, down when I was at the Bilderberg conference this year, and I hope you're familiar with the Bilderberg, as I oh, oh, yeah. yeah. Well, yeah, yeah. OK, great. Well, I went to Dresden uh, in June, and it was a fascinating, fascinating time slightly scary to see the Pegida, the German right wing um, group over there, you know, which is completely normal. Most of the people are very much pro uh, pro 
white, pro uh, German nationalism, anti any kind of immigration. That, that, they had a very kind of normal, you know, like literally thousands of people every Monday evening were turning out on the streets of, of Dresden. But uh, the main point here being that this is where, I mean, the Bilderberger was clearly where, you know, the the real movers and shakers uh, in the Europe and the United States are getting together. Also, look, worth mentioning, hang on a minute, because wh- how does this stuff all really work? All you need to do is to look at Italy and the P2 Lodge in Italy. And you can see you've got all of the real kind of elite institutions, power brokers, you're talking about police, secret services, basically running the country at a, at a secret committee meeting every week, you know. And this, I think, you know, newspapers, secret services, bankers, all buddies with each other, including people from opposite political parties. But anyway, sorry, I've kind of gone off on a bit of a thread. What was your question again from your listener? She talked about the uh, EU army. We have about, uh, just yeah. let you know, we have about 10 minutes. So we, would, we do want to look on the, on the positive side, but we want to answer that regarding the EU army, shoot away. Yeah, well, so, uh, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's um, a consolidation of power, isn't it? I mean, it's one organisation, effectively. Um, and it was simple, simply the fact that at the beginning of the Second World War, the Americans decided they wanted one embassy to talk to. They didn't want to talk to 30 different embassies. And that's one of the reasons I, far, I feel that uh, the Bilderberg is the place to be. In fact, the other thing is, when I was there, I met some really interesting people. This is why I was going to, uh, I brought it up. There was a guy called Volker Reusing, and he was from North Germany, I think Wuppertal somewhere, just a kind of Ordinary lawyer, very, very kind of plain speaking guy. But he explained to me, he said, look, and you can find this on on YouTube if you look for it. Maybe you can put a link up at the end of the show. Uh, it is, is Bilderberg Expo, Exposed in Dresden. I did a series of five or six interviews when I was over there. Bilderberg Exposed in Dresden. And what he explained is that you've got this whole, well, various laws have been passed through the European Parliament uh, into law now by the Commission. And this particular one is called nation state bankruptcy, right? So it means that what happens when your country goes bankrupt, say Ireland goes bankrupt, what happens? And they've now actually passed laws in the EU to say effectively the police and the civil service and the army all become the property uh, of the banks. So your Irish, I mean, still in Britain, this is this is law until we leave the EU. So the nation state bankruptcy procedures are absolutely hideous. The other thing is that they have also passed European laws that allow the suing of any newspaper by anyone that believes that they've had uh, any kind of damage by, from that newspaper. So if if a uh, an article has hurt someone's career, even if it's true, they can still sue you. In fact, they can take down uh, media institutions. So have a look for that. The guy's name is Volker Reusing. And uh, he's a lawyer in Germany and he was explaining, look, guys, you know, these people are out to get us. And this is a kind of fascist system which has been set up in the EU. The idea being that everyone has to kind of go down this road, otherwise they get booted by the banks as Britain, as Greece has already been done. And Britain is about to do because what we're dealing with, really, I think, is the use of banks instead of tanks. In the Second World War, tanks would roll in, take over your village, your town, kill people. Well, banks are doing the same. They're killing people. They're taking away basic benefits, people's food, people's livelihoods. I mean, you were talking about evictions. That's happening more and more now with the bank's rule. Uh, And so I think we have to be extremely wary about Brussels. And I don't think it's actually going to happen, the United States of Europe. I really honestly don't believe that they can do it now. But I think they're going to, there's a lot of people going to be hurt in the process of getting back our sovereignty. I think there's, there are a lot of positives uh, happening and there are a lot of changes going on, although be it slow. Uh, and I think you're right. I don't think it will happen. Um, there are good things happening in the background. <laughs> um, when we've, we've had, you know, we, and we're, we, we got the, the statistics saying that we average about two suicides a day. Now, in Ireland, the, you know, of a population of four and a half, five million people, that's an awful lot of people. And this is, again, ignored by the, by the government. But we have about uh, 10 minutes, Tony. So what's, uh, uh, what's your positive take on things? <laughs> OK, I know, look, I know I've been being a bit grim, but I mean, I think you do have to, in a way, you've got to kind of get go down into the pit to see how bad things are before you pop up with some solutions. Yeah. And uh, yeah, the the solutions I see it is one is an amazing thing about humanity. And I, I learned this for the first time when I when I visited South America years ago, decades ago, is that when people are oppressed, 
my God, they come together. And they really do start, you know, there's less of this Facebook nonsense and people are just right, you know, their their communities actually come together to help. When services are taken away, everyone is then moaning about the government. People are that much more aware, I think, that what's happening in the mainstream media bears no real relevance to their lives, to our lives, etc. And you'll get a much better analysis and conversation quite often down the pub than you will on the telly. So people just don't watch it. Young people, look, that's for me the most positive sign. Yeah, I think a lot of young people. OK, so, you know, young people are always into trivia and that kind of stuff, you know, hair or whatever, yeah. things, clothes. But I think when it comes to politics, you meet increasingly, I do anyway, youngsters who have got an incredibly switched on uh, point of view that they know that there is this kind of new world order. If you talk to them about the Illuminati, they'll know exactly who they are historically. They will also be aware of the whole sort of Freemasonry cult and their influence in history. So even though these things are taboo on the mainstream media, they're talked about all the time amongst teenagers, people in their early 20s. The younger generation, I think, is coming up with a credible, much more knowledge than we had when we were growing up at that age about how the world really works. And so the solutions are going to come from them, I think, the youngsters. Mind uh, you, we, we, we didn't have the Internet, Tony, did we? So, uh, you know, I mean, the Internet has to, you know... Has no, to... but look, to be fair, the mainstream press was a lot better. I mean, we had ba yeah. things like balanced documentaries coming out until, you know, early, mid-1990s. We had a mainstream press that would, would, you know, dish the dirt when things went wrong. Mm. Uh, and thank God the Internet appeared just about at the right time there, didn't it? You know, so... Uh, we've got a tremendous amount. And the thing is, the truth is out there, like they say on the X-Files. You know, if there's anything you really want to have a look at and you want to get to the bottom of it, you could. I mean, we did, for example, with the um, murder of Alexander Litvinenko, this guy who was murdered with polonium, this mm. radioactive stuff. Famous picture of him dying on a bed. That's you know, right. The in, Russian I mean, guy, yeah. You know, there's, there's lots of talk on the mainstream press. Oh, we don't know what happened, blah, 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 blah. Yes, we do. Sorry, guys, we do know what happened. And if you take the trouble, you can go out there and find it. Uh, one of the places that I do this is on our 9-11. Uh, um, it's, it's, it's actually called The Quest for Truth, The War on Freedom and The Quest for Truth, 911forum.org.uk. And that's another thing I'm involved in as a moderator on that. I'm on there quite a lot, you know, just sort of wading in and saying, how about this article? We, we, we pretty much put together a trail which pins the murder of Litvinenko on this Russian oligarch Boris Berezovsky. Uh, I mean, he was involved. It's a fascinating story. And this is it's a can of worms. Uh, I called it on the radio on Friday. I called it a silo of snakes because it's so big because it goes right back to how Putin uh, came to power. And the uh, false flag bomb attacks in 1999 in Moscow and around there, uh, which were used in, as an order uh, in order to uh, re-kick off again the Chechen war. There was, these attacks were, were uh, bombs were planted by actually by the Russian Secret Service, the FSB, but they were blamed on the Chechens. And because uh, he was a chief in the FSB at the time, Putin covered these up. Now, he covered these up, in, uh, and although they were perpetrated by the Western intelligence services and by Boris Berezovsky, this oligarch, and then what happened was Putin was trusted by Berezovsky as his little puppet president. So, and then what happened? Ha! Huh. Well, Putin turned the tables on Berezovsky and gave him 24 hours to leave the country a few years later. And so that's how Putin came to power. And I think it's fascinating that you can actually go back and have a look at some of the original documentaries. For example, there's one on NTV called The Assassination of Russia, which is basically a documentary made by the first ever independent Russian TV channel, all about the uh, Litvinenko book, which is blowing up Russia. The book is called, that was published, I think, about 2008. Uh, but the, the, the documentary is one of the most incredible things you'll ever see. It's, it's, got, uh, it's got the Secret Service people who are in charge, the local police, plus the, the residents of this big uh, apartment block just outside Moscow, where they found a massive bomb that was going to blow this apartment block to pieces. And they all were in the same studio together and they're various people accusing each other and saying, well, no, that's not what happened, is it? And that's the kind of telly I'd like to see. And if I was a director general of the BBC, you'd have that sort of thing every night. Definitely have both sides to it. We have another question, one more <laughs> question for you. Steve. Yeah, Joan is wondering, um, Ruth, uh, Tony, do you have a pr any problem uh, or have you had any problems from any groups after attending a Bilderberg meeting knowing that you're going to be discussing topics that were discussed there? Well, I mean, I get, I get a lot of, uh, you know, sort of, I suppose, 
hate mail of various sorts. I've had four, about four or five death threats now. You know, yes, I mean, of course, you're going to get some flack for saying this stuff. But the thing is, at the end of the day, for me, uh, I think you've just got to do journalism. At the For me, I don't care where the story ends. You've got to follow the story uh, to wherever it ends, even if it is to the rich and powerful, which it normally is, actually. Uh, any of these big stories I've followed, including things like uh, the collaboration between the Allies uh, and the Nazis at the end of the Second World War, Prince Bernhard of the Netherlands, uh, who was basically a Nazi agent in London at the end of World War Two, you'll find that you know most many many of these stories do go right back to the ruling elite, uh, the Tory Party, uh, the royal family, and and if you if you're not going to follow the story to the end, you may as well not start it in the first place. I mean, obviously, you know, the Princess Diana assassination being one obvious example of that. Yeah, no, I mean, it's incredible um, how interlaced people are when they're in the actual, um, in the, uh, the secret societies and the elite, and it's the control, and we've, we've always said on the show, it's a bit like mafia gangs where they don't like each other, but they need each other to keep the system going, because if the system, you know, if any one part falls down, then the rest is going to crumble. But Well, no, it, it is a mafia, yeah, yeah. It's, it's the same, they even have the same sort of oaths, don't they, the Omerta type of oaths in the, in the Freemasons, mm-hmm. worth also mentioning in China, you know, you've got the Yakuza societies, you've, you've got the triads. They also have, funnily enough, they've got the same secret signs as the Freemasons have. And if you look at the Freemason Odes, you'll see they go back to witchcraft. You'll see exact parallels with some of the wording of witchcraft. The idea being that, you know, basically you're surrendering your life to the master of the lodge, the coven or whatever. And you're saying, well, if I step out of line, you can kill me. Well, anyone that says that really has got it coming to them. And they're basically traitors to the rest of us. And this is why I draw the parallel with the Lord of the Rings. You've got a similar kind of thing going on there with uh, Saruman, you know, the, the wizard who throws his lot in with the bad guys. You know, I don't think that we should allow these secret societies. I think because they should be banned. And certainly these people should not be allowed to take public office because their loyalty is to their religious cult and not to us. Totally agree. To- listen, we're definitely, definitely going to have to do a part two because that <laughs> subject alone is going to fill up a full show because we've had an ex uh, uh, Mason on here and uh, we've, you know, experiences of that. But listen, Tony, it's been brilliant having you on. Thanks a lot for coming on. We'll definitely do a part two in the new year. Um, and we'll do it. We'll do a full show next time. I'm going to pass you over to Steve. Steve's going to get all your contact details, where people can find you, and where they can track you down. And I mean that in a nice way. <laughs> well, it's the easiest place to find it, the show and download it. I mean, you can stick it on your phone, put it in your car, and have a listen when there's something boring on the radio. Don't kick the radio. Put one of our MP3s on. Uh, you'll find them. Uh, find this uh, all at thisweek.org.uk. Nice and easy to remember. Thisweek.org.uk. Okay, thisweek.org.uk. Yeah, some people asking there for the And also, if people have got stories for me, they want to email, that's no problem. All the links are there. Uh, just a, a very a very quick question, Tony. It does say that you you were involved with Bristol Community Radio. I'm just wondering, is that still going? Do we have the, do you do live streams and podcasts? Well, you certainly do, yeah. Just like Johnny Walker is still going. Yeah, Bristol yeah. Community. Yeah. It's Bristol Community FM, and we're, we do a, a live show from 5 p.m. till 7 p.m. every Friday. The first hour is really with a local politician or an MP, uh, looking into the stuff from that week's news nationally mostly and some locally. And then we really we, we really uh, go for it in the second hour, looking into all sorts of you know more esoteric stuff and also trying to get to the bottom of some of these massive taboos. Uh, we, we, we just started a new series uh, of particular, particularly looking at, for example, this week we did the money system, a whole load of... Uh, you know, sort of expose really. We had the uh, Chancellor's autumn statement and saying, well, look, this is what he's not saying, and nobody is saying it either. We had the whole thing on surveillance well, with the passing of the Snoopers Charter, which is where we got into looking at all this stuff by uh, Edwin Black, the, the IBM and the Holocaust, and that sort of thing. So, you know, we, get a, we, we really do every week try and push the boat out to. Allow the listeners to keep ahead of the curve a bit. Okay, brilliant. Well, that's great, Tony. Okay, Tony, t- stay with us there for a minute. We're just going to go off to a musical break. But thanks again for coming on. Just uh, stay with us there for no, a minute. Thank you very Cheers. much for having me on. Cheers. This is Open Your Mind Radio on OYMRadio.com, UnitedWeStrike.com, and PeoplesInternetRadio.com. Okay, we're back. Eye in the sky. Um, we just want to make, just want to say that these are Alan's uh, 45s that we're playing here <laughs> on the old turntable. 
Looking yeah. down my CD and collection. I, I have to say, well done. You can't hear the scratch. <laughs> no, I don't know. Well, that's because you, you never obviously never played them. No. Um, yeah, great information there from Tony. Um, I know some people were saying that uh, get him on for a part two. He has agreed uh, to come on in a couple of months' time. So, yes, uh, we'll have more from um, Tony. We'll do a full show with Tony. Now, um, what was I going to say? Yeah, uh, apologies to Hilfiger. Thanks, Chris, for just um, uh, reminding me there. Is that actually Hugo Boss who did the German army uniforms I knew it was one of them um, so I not, thought it was Hilfiger he was an aftershave guy no? yeah I think he does um, he does aftershave as well but yeah they did the uh, the black uniforms for the Nazis oh, um, very stylish so I do think Hilfiger's in there somewhere though something in the back of my head says they they were involved in something anyway um, so there you go so any other business before we um, close everything down um, yes, we're still trying to get this lady, Anya, who left a message on the answer machine. Anya, if you're out there, give us a call. Um, you left a message on the answer machine, but you didn't leave your phone number, and we don't have any contact details for you. So if you can give us a shout, um, Anya, we will be happy to speak to you about your idea about a doing a painting or sculptor to raise funds for the homeless. Um, and um, if you want to uh, just remind people about the Open Your Mind um, conference there, Steve. Yes. I'd be delighted. Thanks for giving me the, mm. <laughs> the page. Yeah, the Open Mind Conference uh, that we spoke of last week is in Dooley's Hotel in Waterford City. Uh, that's the place to be on February the 25th and 26th in 2017. It's brought to you by the Awake and Aware in South East Ireland group. And as we did mention, uh, tickets for this unique event are selling out rapidly. But you can get an early board weekend pass for the whole event for only €49, Euros, which is a bargain uh, for these type of events. The limited early board tickets offer is until the 31st of December. And hint, hint, they would make a great Christmas present for somebody. Exactly. There you go. I'm sure they did that. Uh, they do aftershave as well. Aftershave? Aftershave, yeah. Hmm. Aftershave. 